The supply chain has obviously been, in the past year or, or 14 months, the supply chain has been under enormous strain. In fact, it's, uh, it's um, been all but torn apart in some areas. Um, a lack of government-backed insurance support and uncertainty around stage four of the conditional reopening roadmap has meant that some event operators have held off on paying suppliers' deposits. There are also concerns over a talent drain as workers have had to seek income from other sectors. Meanwhile, infrastructure has been repurposed or brought out of sector. How will that impact the, um, how will that, um, impact the supply chain on a long-term basis is what we want to discuss in this panel, and also how the um, unprecedented move in terms of events to the uh, latter half of the summer and September, um, how that will uh, be coped with, um, with a supply chain that's, that's um, been damaged um, throughout the pandemic. Um, I'll start by introducing the panel. If we start with Liz, who's on my immediate right. Um, Liz is the group director of award-winning staging and, temp and temporary structures company, No Nonsense Group. Among its clients this year are Standing Calling, Hampton Court Music Festival, Beautiful Days, and Concert at the Kings. Um, on Liz's right, we have Nick Morgan. Um, he is the CEO of event, event production company, We Are The Fair, and vice chairman of the Association of Independent Festivals. His company is set to work with at least 138 shows this year, including El Dorado Festival and Gala Festival. On Nick's right, we've got Stuart Galbraith. He's um, the CEO uh, of Kilimanjaro Live and Concert Promoters Association Vice President. Um, his wealth of concert and festival promoting experience includes record-breaking stadium runs with Ed Sheeran and helping to develop the Monsters of Rock Festival at Donington Park. <laughs> being a key, uh, that's going back a little bit, but get, being a key player in the um, download, wireless and high park calling. And at Kilimanjaro Festival-wise, um, the main interest now is, is Belladrum and Tartan Heart Festival in Scotland. Um, last but not least, we've got John Drape. He's the founder of Manchester-based events production company, Engine Number no. 4. And the company was behind two of 2020's most high-profile socially distant event spaces, the Virgin Money Unity Arena and Escape to Freight Island. This year, the company's projects include Manchester International Festival, Kending Calling, Lost Village, and Park Life. So, um, Let's start with a question, actually, to, to you, Nick. Um, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a myriad of issues here with the supply chain, but in terms, of, um, in terms of what you're seeing in terms of suppliers, you know, I've, I've heard that sh some suppliers are sharply increasing their prices um, and others are not being able to meet demand. So, for example, I mean, I've had serious stages, for example. Uh, it's a major operator, but they've had to pull out of quite a few of their events. So... Um, so how, how is that sort of, um, from your perspective, at the stage we're at right now, right now hopefully going into an era where we're uh, going to be able to have some full capacity events, how damaged is the supply chain? Uh, I mean, obviously they've had a torrid year, as have we all. Um, yeah, some have gone into other industries, so things like, you know, toilets, a lot, a lot of their inventory has been sold off to other uh, areas like construction to shore up their balance sheets. So. Uh, understandably, uh, and then some have understood, you know, the credit terms within constructions must be much more preferable. Why would they come back? Some suppliers I know will never come back to the industry, so we have lost people. Um, and there is definitely a lack of kit on some shows. I mean, we don't need to go granular, but you know, try and get a cabin at the moment on most shows. Either you're paying three times uh, what it normally would cost, uh, or you know, we're looking at alternatives. You know, so we're like marking out most of our. Sort of production uh, for the summer so you know and that is putting more pressure in terms of producers so for our team you know there's a lot more phone calls uh, so it is very stressful uh, but it is all equally I can understand for supply chain but the problem at the moment is there is an element on some suppliers of profiteering you know we are seeing a huge incremental or exponential increases in price on some shows and and obviously promoters have sold out so effectively their P&L set and then now we're starting to see that margin being rubbed away. And some shows I know have sold out and effectively as it stands, you know, if they <coughs> produce it with all that supply, uh, it will actually run at a loss. So it is a massive concern. Um, yeah. Okay. And um, I mean, Liz, from your perspective, obviously, you know, as a supplier, um, you know, the, 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 con the construction industry has been kind of impacted by the, by the um, pandemic. Um, you've got Brexit, you've got, you know, various, various issues that are kind of coming together to create issues and problems and strain. I mean, um, 
and I think, you know, when we were having a kind of pre-event conversation, you were mentioning there was something like a, forgive me, forgive me if I've got this slightly wrong, but 26 lead, week lead time on steals. Certain what, things, yeah. What, what, what experience are you having at the moment and how are you, how are you coping? Well, obviously, you know, people have a finite amount of kit. Um, you do your best to try and help everybody. Um, we have had a couple of clients that sort of said, can you fabricate more stuff, we'll pay you. Um, but when you've gone out there, there's a, you know, there is a real shortage of materials. There's 26 week, week lead time for some of the steel we need. Aluminium's almost doubled in price. And when you've just gone through 18 months of very little work, you haven't really got those res, you know, reserves in place to, to start fabricating lots of new kit. But um, people are getting creative. There's lots more collaboration going on. Um, you know, people who were really quite secretive on what they were doing are now opening up, which is great because that's, you know, how we operate anyway. But really, it's just trying to work together to try and service as many events as possible. We all know not that not everything is going to go ahead, but until it's not happening, you have to assume it is and, and give it the same respect that you do for every other event you're looking at. Yes, Stuart, I mean, you're, you're obviously involved in um, the Concept Promoters Association. The Concept Promoters Association is one of 13 organisations that's un now under the kind of live umbrella banner, if you like, that was organised or launched by Greg Palmer and a few others in the last year. And that's a great example of the promoter side of the industry, or organising side of the industry, coming together to collaborate and speak with one clear voice, etc. And um, you know, work in a way that I guess has been more collaborative than ever before. I mean. It, with that sort of more unified atmosphere happening on that side, are people, is that, are promoters kind of more aware and more prepared to kind of work in a more appreciative way to, with the supply chain, if that's a bit right way of pinning it? Is, is, that, is that sort of, um, is there that sort of willingness to kind of be, be flexible and lenient and sort of share equipment maybe between suppliers or, or different companies? Or yeah, different I, I think, um, well, I think, look, you always have to look for silver, silver linings to clouds and certainly uh, the formation of live, which was primarily driven by Greg, myself, Phil Bowdry, um, really only came about because we were in uh, crisis mode. Um, last April, uh, we as a sector were not getting coverage in media, we weren't getting listened to by government. Uh, we had no direct dial um, uh, input into either DCMS, Treasury or the Cabinet Office. Uh, and so it really came about by necessity. Um, but it has certainly led to a, an organisation that truly can uh, claim to represent the entire sector. Um, if you look at the, the 13 associations that, that represent or make up live, um, then they, they represent 3,250 companies, uh, nearly 300,000 employees, uh, and a contribution to Exchequer of nearly four billion pounds. Um, so we, we are getting heard. Um, but in terms of, of the production side of things, I mean, Andy Lentor from PSA, who I know is here somewhere, uh, it sits in on our, our meetings along with Dave Keithley. Um, and so the, the production side of things is very, very much represented within the, the voice that we're putting to government. Um, but we, we absolutely have seen an opening up. I mean, I know more about Melvin Benn's business now than I've ever known. Um, and, uh, and equally, we, we have these historic calls where you'll actually see Paul Reed and Melvin Benn agreeing on a phone call. <laughs> um, uh, and, and so I think that there is uh, a sense of, it's almost like blitz mentality, which is that we have to work together. Uh, and there certainly has been a great deal of that uh, in the last few weeks and, and months. As we come out of it, um, as someone in my office the other day said, oh, it's all right, people are becoming arseholes again. Um, so I, th I think competition will start to come back into play as, as we, we start to see events happen again. Yeah, absolutely. But I'm just wondering in terms of, you know, um, there's a lot of rush now to put events on in September, for example. There's only so much supply chain equipment and everything, our personnel and companies and everything else sort of available, I suppose, to, to, to work on those events. And one of the things we were talking about yesterday was, um, you know, going forward in the next couple of years, there's going to be a rush. The, the seasons are going to become extremely, you know, there's so many events and shows have been put back, you know, you know, much better than I, that, you know, the, the, the venues are going to be full, the festival seasons are going to be packed, and there's only so much demand for those events. So the industry does need to work together to kind of make sure that's handled properly. But in the same event, in the same sense, 
of coming together to make sure things are, ha are handled well. Is there a way, I think, that's sort of on the promoter side that people can kind of look to maybe share, you know, to, to, to plan those events a little bit better in, in the mind of the fact that the supply chain has been impacted or even share equipment in a way that they might not have done before? I think, look, over, over the years, whether it be Live Nation, AEG, uh, Festival Republic, we, we'll have dialogue between, between ourselves about when are you going on sale, when are you going on sale, and we can avoid the marketplace from a marketing point of view. Um, in terms of um, staging, toilets, etc., I don't think you're going to see that uh, come to play because everyone's going to have a, a commercial agenda on why they need to be that particular weekend. Um, whether it be local considerations, bank holidays, local lockdowns, etc. Um, so I, I don't think that you're going to see that air of cooperation um, continue across the board because at the end of the day, there'll then be commercial competition that comes into play. Okay, John. Um, question to you, John. In terms of, um, you know, a lot of equipment has been brought out of sector. Um, you know, there's, there's a shortage of all sorts of of sorts of, um, of um, equipment and uh, necessities for events. I mean, what do you think the long? What do you think the short-term impact of that is going to be this season, and also long-term? Is it going to? Is it going to? Is that going to hit the market? Is that going to affect the market going into next year and beyond? Um, it's an interesting question. I think the long-term picture will be, will be positive. All the suppliers that we've engaged with um, want to get back into the festival industry. Want to get back doing events. But the uncertainty that we've all lived in has, has led to them pivoting and working in other sectors. And unfortunately, where we're at at the moment is, is we still aren't 100% confident we've got a season this year. There's no insurance in place, as we know. So there's no trickle down of deposits or, or money going out of shows into suppliers' bank accounts. So those suppliers are still working in those other sectors. And until we start seeing that movement of cash through the industry, then it, we are going to be in a difficult situation. And as you say, the end of the season it, it, it is congested. Um, you know, it's having a wider implication apart from just the supply, the contract supply chain. You know, we, we can't you know, dismiss the huge impact this has had on freelancers uh, and the staffing scene. And certainly what we're finding is an awful lot of staff have pivoted, working in other industries as well. They really want to come back into the festival industry um, will jump at the opportunity, but until I can give them a contract, give them a deposit, give them some confidence that they will be working on Kendall Calling at the end of July, then they're going to carry on working for the Department of Transport, working in the local supermarket, and so on and so forth. So, you know, there, there is, when we were talking about this just before, that, you know, we're, we're heading towards the point, everyone's looking at the 14th of June and the 21st of June as, as, as these two critical dates and, and they really are and there's going to be a huge scramble after that for staff and equipment and there's going to be an awful lot of quick cash movement if we get the the, the answers that we uh, that we all hope we'll get right now as we stand or as we sit i mean how damaged is the supply chain from your perspective i mean how obviously it's not irreparable and you're confident it's going to be you know it's going to be fine going forward but right now how much damage have you have you seen to the sector well, fortunately, I mean, our season has been relatively decimated. So we've, we, we took the early call in, in October last year to reschedule part life from early June to September. So, yeah, I'm, I'm involved in, in one of those shows that has caused the congestion. And part life's a significant show. It's 80,000 people. It relies on a huge amount of equipment uh, and uh, personnel. Um, but also with that comes a good level of loyalty from the supply chain. Liz being a prime example of that, no nonsense supply, one of our key stages. Um, and we've seen that uh, you know, across most suppliers. But we've been trying to have uh, very open and honest conversations with suppliers and say, look, we, we are, for this year at least, we're all in this together. And you know, tell me if you're struggling, tell me if you can't do it. We've had those conversations with Liz, we're serious, right across the board, and to try and manage our way, way through it because clearly we all need the live industry to get back. We all need to be back in the field working. We know that there's the audience demand for it. Those tickets have been sold. So it's the case of us all trying to work together to, to get back there. And once that money starts moving again and we, and we can get back to a bit more of a structured season, then the su supply
supply chain will, will bounce back. There's definitely the appetite there to invest in new equipment, in, in, in new inventory. Once the steel and the commodities start rolling through the ports again, that, that then the fabrication you know, will occur and we'll get back to the innovation and the creativity that, 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 that we're known for. But I think that innovation is, is coming into play with, with how we deliver shows at the moment because you know, we're, we're looking at the, the, the COVID risk as another risk and we're looking at the challenge of the supply chain and the staffing issues as we do the other challenges that we deal, whether it be weather, audience behaviour, etc. So if, if anyone can try and overcome these challenges, I think our industry can. Great, great. Good to hear. I mean, Stuart, you obviously moved Belladrum back to September. I mean, that's obviously, as we've already mentioned, clearly bit, <laughs> end of the road is now almost the middle of the road. Um, um, what, what considerations? What, what were your considerations in terms of supply chain? Were, was, was, were you concerned that that would become uh, an issue by moving back to September? Obviously, you're avoiding the, you're making it more likely to be able to go ahead um, under government guidance. But are, is the supply chain kind of uh, issue a concern? Yeah, I, I think it's actually a good case study and highlights a couple of things that we've, we've already touched on. Uh, so. Uh, for various local reasons, the only dates that we could move Belladrum to were September 10. Um, that happened to be the same weekend that Tea in the Park is, uh, or oh, sorry, um, Transmit is running in Glasgow. So Scotland's biggest camping festival and Scotland's biggest one day event were going to take place on the same weekend. There was nothing that we could do about it. It was the only weekend that we could run. It's the only weekend that made sense for Jeff to move his event to. Um, but we actually looked at, at um, what was happening in the locale. The Highlands has had very low infection rates and there's very much a public feeling that we shouldn't run. Um, and so we, we actually took that feeling on board, listened to our customers and moved to next year. Uh, so we're not running this year. But in making those decisions, uh, certainly supply chain was part of that um, uh, uh, process. Um, and we were facing challenges on toilets, um, and certainly our toilet bill was probably going to be about 40 grand more than, than we had in the budget. Uh, we were running into issues um, with security, particularly because we were the same weekend as uh, Transmit. There were only so many security staff in Scotland uh, that are qualified and, and experienced enough, and a lot of those are now working permanent jobs at testing centres or tr vaccination locations, etc. Um, and, and we were running into issues with, with staging. So by the time you add all of that together, yes, we could have taken the risk and run this year. Oh, and I forgot, we didn't have any insurance. So we, 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 were we up for risking five million quid without, without any um, uh, safety net? And so in the end, we decided, no, we're, we're not gonna do that and we've moved to next year. And we've had a 95% ticket retention. So we'll, we'll run next year, it will be sold out. Uh, it'll take place in 2022, having sold the vast majority of the tickets in August 2019. So it will be three years uh, uh, for us to provide that product. And we, we made similar decisions actually, Stuart, on, uh, on Blue Dot Festival, because Blue Dot was due to take place in, in, in July. And, um, you know, we looked at all those issues. You know, can we deliver a show that the audience, because it's got quite a sophisticated audience, it's a very particular show, can we deliver what they want or are we better just leaving it for another year? And we've, we've postponed and we've got that good, good ticket retention. Great, okay. I mean, Nick, you're obviously working on around about 140 shows. So, um, you know, that's, that's, that's quite, a, quite a, a large number of events to, to be working on this year. Um, when it comes to kind of just getting the technical skill people to, to work on them, I mean, are there any concerns at all? I mean, obviously, you know, you've seen some people have had to pivot, obviously, to the most overused word for the last nine months. But I mean, people have had to pivot, people have had to just do other jobs to bring in to, to, to keep a roof over their heads. Um, so you've, you've seen a lot of people move over to film and TV, for example. But then even the people that, that are available to come back, there's, there's going to be the issues of people being rusty. They haven't done that job for 10 months. They haven't done that job for 14 months, maybe. Maybe even longer because uh, of the timing of this whole thing. But um, what, what experience are you having and what concerns do you have in that regard when it comes to sort of personnel and skills? Yeah, uh, I mean, we had a hot debrief with Melvin uh, about Sefton, and one of the key findings from that was uh, a slight concern. You know, lots of the supply chain, say, like cabins, have already been trading and they've got COVID policies throughout COVID. Uh, but some, of, especially on the tech side, it did take them. They were a bit rusty. 
uh, and one of the sort of feedbacks was uh, a, a bit around non-compliance of COVID measures and, and just they were slower and obviously relearning. I mean, that's so our team, we spent hours and hours in the office doing like tabletop scenarios, planning, you know, this is what you do. And um, so it is a concern. And on our first two shows, we've actually built in an extra two days of build just for that very reason. You know, and that's been a collaborative sort of working relationship with both the promoter and the suppliers, just saying, you know, we're all in it together. We've got a very early show. You know, we're doing Kenwood House three days after the announcement. You know, we'll be on site prior to the announcement. So, you know, big risk, you know, you know, it's not my risk in terms of promoters, but obviously we're still exposed because we have started offloading money into that supply chain because we need to, to secure the inventory. Um, so I think it is a concern, but like John says, you know, people are thriving to get back into industry. Um, yeah, and, uh, and, and suppliers are there, it's just, it is a battle. And the, we're trying to get kit now because I, I'm, I'm concerned that like, 21st of June is going to be like a bum fight, you know. Uh, people are going to be offloading money left, right and centre, and then you're getting to sort of trading deals, which is a concern. And then we could see exponential, you know, rises in cost of that kit um, and pushing shows into a negative position. How would that impact you, Liz? I mean, if you get to the point where you suddenly have a huge rush, would you be in a situation where you have to push prices up? Um, I mean, for us, pushing prices up is, is just not an option. You know, we're all in this together, you know, and, it, and it's certainly not right to take advantage of anybody that's kind of in a bad situation and needs help out of the hole. Um, you know, we have had a couple of suppliers that asked us if we would discount you know, sort of on previous prices, and we said no. Um, but what we did say was, you know, some of our costs have increased. We will absorb those costs because we understand that the clients will have their own extra costs to absorb. You know, and the understanding is that nobody's going to make the same profit margins this year. But the idea is we all need to be able to do something. You know, we are in it together. We've had very open and frank conversations with clients, especially over like the bank holiday weekend in September, and said, look, I can't kind of build everybody's job on the same day. I just can't do it. I don't have the same amount of crew. I don't have that same skilled workforce that I used to have. So, you know, ones that can move and be flexible. And, and it's lovely to see that people are quite willing to look at a big picture and not just at their own jobs. Um, you know, because in previous years, you know, people have been able to have blinkers on and been able to mm. quite happily say, well, you know, my job's the most important, so I'm all right, Jack, as, you know, somebody else can worry about the others. But everybody is just really conscious that we all need to get through this. We need the, the promoters to get through. You know, the artists need us all to get through. The suppliers need the clients as much as the clients need the suppliers. And there's been a real genuine... There's been a lot of relationships have really developed and blossomed instead of them just being at the end of the phone or an email. You know, people have really talked. You know, I've got to know some of my clients better than, you know, some of my family almost because we've had kind of week to week conversations. You know, what happens if, how would we tackle this? If I needed to do this, what would happen? Um, but I think, you know, anyone who profiteers out of this, shame on them. Yeah, okay. I mean, obviously, the supply chain has been very damaged and people have lost their jobs and they've had to go and do other jobs they don't want to do. But, but Stuart, do you feel that actually collectively, after this whole hideous episode's over, we are going to be in a better position as an industry across the supply chain, across the promoter side, across everything else, bearing in mind the, you know, the, the, the uniting of the industry in certain regards and the fact that perhaps now we've got uh, in front of government in a way that we hadn't been able to before in terms of emphasising our economic value and everything else? Uh, yeah, yeah. The, answer, the simple answer to that is yes, I think we will be in a better position. Um, and I think we'll be in a better position um, on the basis that we've got a much better dialogue, where well, we have some dialogue now with government, which we never previously had. Um, it certainly has exposed for us uh, a, um, a dawning realisation that, that many civil servants and many departments really don't know what they're doing uh, and don't understand our business. And, and part of our um, aim with Live is to get more understanding of what we collectively as an industry do. Uh, the, first, the first piece of work we did was, was very quickly to pull together the scale of what we are. No one knew. No one knew how many people worked in the live event sector no one, or the music sector. 
no one knew how much we, we contributed to, to Exchequer. Um, and so I think we had some, some early on gains uh, or some wins uh, with uh, hashtag let the music play, uh, which helped grow the CRF uh, uh, allocation that was coming out of Treasury, reputedly from 500 million to 1.5 billion. Uh, we certainly lobbied hard for the, the uh, reduction in VAT, which again filters down throughout the sector. Um, and going forward, I think it's uh, the, the things that we have to do are, um, are to, to make sure that collection societies are not uh, uh, becoming too greedy and fight that wherever it is necessary. Um, push on a long-term basis for a cultural rate of VAT, which is um, uh, prevalent throughout most of our uh, European territory equivalents, but just not in existence in the UK. Um, and then also we need to push um, and continue to push uh, for the inception of a government underwritten insurance scheme uh, because that again will get the organisers, the risk takers, the confidence to actually come out and start putting things on sale where currently there's reticence. Uh, and that insurance policy will be set so that it is um, something that will effectively ensure the income and then filter all the way down through so that the likes of John and I will be able to contract something and say, we will pay you even if our event is cancelled. Uh, so it'll have a benefit all the way down to the very person that unloads the truck or mans the bar, etc. cetera. Um, so, so yes, I, I think there's, there will be good that's come out of this. There will be long-term good that comes out of this. Um, and I think in years to come, we'll look back at live and go, oh, how did live come about? And, and it's, it's a bit like the CPA. The CPA only ever came about because we were all faced with a massive common enemy, which is called PRS, who were trying to treble uh, the rate at the time. And the CPA has gone on and existed for 30 years after that. The whole insurance issue has obviously been a very, very key one for a very long time. And everyone's been sort of hanging on to find out if it's actually going to happen or not. And that's... Yeah, clearly, as we've already discussed, you know, suppliers aren't going to get the deposits until they, there is some sort of security there. But you know, there's been a lot of work behind the scenes, I know, going on to try and persuade government to do something useful in this regard. Um, you're probably much closer to it than I. So, I mean, in terms of, I mean, we've, Dowden's kind of hinted that, that you know, if we do know there's going to, be, going to be a reopening date on the 21st, they will look at it, at least. They will kind of, you know, it's potentially going to happen around that time, there will be something. But, but what, you're much closer to, it to, to me. What, what, how confident are you that we will at least the industry will at least get something that's going to get those dominoes falling? Look, it's, it's, and it's, it's a bit like um, it's a bit like what happened after 9/11 or the London bombings. Uh, you just couldn't buy terrorism cover in the marketplace. Full stop. Eventually, the commercial market will come back in. And indeed, I heard even this week that someone's actually prepared to take COVID uh, uh, contingency cover. But the, the premium is just astronomical. Um, and so the, the whole idea of a government underwritten scheme um, uh, such that was put in place after terrorism is to just fill that gap until the commercial market has the confidence to step back in uh, or indeed will come back in at a rate that people will find acceptable. Um, I think the, um, the battle that we've had on insurance has been um, symptomatic of, of dealing with DCMS. They do not understand. And even Dowden's statement to say that he's, they're going to look at it after June the 21st just has no cognizance nor recognition of the, the issue that we're dealing with and the fact that that is just then too late. The summer will have gone by then. Um, and so I, I don't, we personally, or I personally don't feel that we'll see an underwriting scheme probably take effect until early, early next year, quarter one, quarter two next year. So I, I think it will not have any benefit for this summer. Okay, Nick, I mean, in term, in, in, if that does happen, it's not coming, if, if the insurance isn't forthcoming this year, how damaging will that be for the um, supply chain, do you think? People are obviously concerned, but understandably, from rates are risking an awful lot of money. Uh, I think we're now in that sort of position where the more bullish promoters are taking the risk. I mean, we could debate all day about if that's a foolish thing to do or not. Uh, as Stuart says, you know, if you take the parallel to the film industry, it was agreed in July. The actual implementation of the scheme was October. So the reality is it just won't. You know, they, they first you've got to implement it and then you've got to go to the underwriting markets for a moment to actually get it, which will now, take, you know, that will also protract the process. So it, uh, for me, it's just not a realistic uh, thing that will be in place this summer. So it is then down to promoters who are effectively fully exposed 
you know, as is the supply chain. So, you know, and, and I think John uh, Annelies have alluded to it, you know, we need that money to start moving, but why would you risk it? You know, at the moment, they don't know. And we're, we're, it's consistently being delayed, these decisions. I know they talk about the 14th, but the reality is events have to be planned now. You know, we don't wake up on the 14th or the 17th and start planning an event for the next month. You know, we're well into SAGs and permissions and licenses are in place. So there's already a huge cost that's, you know, being exposed to. And Liz, what impact will that have on, on, on um, and if, the, if it does, the insurance doesn't happen, we lose a huge chunk of, especially the smaller independent ones, fall out of the market this summer and you're having to wait till next. What, how can you as a business sustain yourself? And obviously, you know, you've got lots of friends in, that, in, in the supply chain world. How confident are you that the breast companies will be able to survive that? To be honest, I'm not sure that they all will. You know, it's, you know, we've been quite fortunate. We've got great working relationships with clients and we've had a number of deposits paid. So we've been able to work with them on their own projects to put together the necessary documentation for SAG meetings and, and to get licenses. But that's not working capital for a supplier. You know, you can only spend that money for the purpose that it's been paid to you for. So if all these events get cancelled, that money in effect has to go into an equivalent of escrow until the event reawakens. It does not help you survive as a supplier. So suppliers will be very much, they will have to make a decision which is going to be difficult. Do they stick doing what they do and just try and find temporary avenues you know, in which to work? Or do they become another, you know, like so many already this year, a supplier to a completely different industry? You know, and yes, you might find somewhere a bit more lucrative. You may have lost most of your really good trained staff. So that one might be easier to train people into. You know, I think it's going to be really difficult. And, um, you know, there's been various conversations had in various groups. I mean, I sit on the council of the PSA and we're all involved in various associations and groups that, you know, there's still so much money sitting in a, an account, you know, linked to the Cultural Recovery Fund. I just don't understand why that can't be the basis of an insurance underwriting scheme. You know, it's been talked about, about by lots of people and nobody can actually find a sensible excuse as why that can't happen. You, sorry to, to, to interrupt. I think you just, you have to accept the dawning reality that UK government do not consider music and events as a priority. It's as simple as that. Uh, they, they don't consider music in the same way they consider arts or galleries or museums or even theatre. Mm. Uh, and that money is more likely, the 250 million that's left in the CRF2, is more likely to filter through to museums, art galleries, uh, and um, subsidised sector. And the frustrating thing is these guys are able to open. And ultimately, if it was directed more at our industry, events would be able to happen. Obviously, if they have to cancel due to outbreaks and whatever, then so be it. But at least that money goes in at the top and it filters all the way down goes through the suppliers, it goes through to the freelancers, and it would be far more evenly distributed than any of the other cultural, reco you know, co cultural recovery fund grants have been. And it really would be a generous and even distribution for everybody. And it just seems that we're having to come up as an industry with the answers to all the issues that they just want to ignore. And, you know, we're a really savvy bunch of people. We make shit happen, often in the most adverse situations. And this is just another situation that we've got to overcome. But the frustrating thing is we've got the answers, we've got the solutions, and we're just still being held back. OK, John, I mean, um, on the subject of moving, moving on a little bit in terms of the subject matter, but we were talking earlier on about obviously what it's this whole uh, pandemic's done in terms of the strength of the supply chain, the, the number of people that are still in it. And uh, I guess, you know, when they come back, whether they're rusty or not, they're, they, they, in terms of going forward, there's obviously going to be a job to do to attract people back into the events industry. Would you agree that, that you know, we are going to have to fill the hole where the, in terms of the, the, the number of qualified people there are to, to work in the supply chain? Is that a concern? And, is this sort of, you know, are we, do we need to work collectively to, to kind of 
to create new training schemes or to, to, to work on a kind of recruitment drive? Um, yeah, I think there needs to be an industry-wide push for employment opportunities when we can give those employment opportunities. I think organisations like the SIA have got a huge role to play when it comes to the security sector, um, which is, is going to struggle coming back. Um, when it comes to you know, more technical jobs, you know, places like the Backstage Academy and BIM and those institutions out there, you know, they've got pupils who've been training throughout the pandemic. You know, there's, there is still the training going on in, in universities and colleges. So we, we've got those personnel coming through. I think the other challenge we've got as an industry when it comes to the, the, the staffing aspect is our reliance on Eastern European labour. Um, you know, a, a lot of staging companies, a lot of security companies, waste management companies are, are reliant on non-UK labour uh, and that workforce is, is not here and, and whether that returns, I don't think anybody is, is too, too sure. So the, there is quite a lot of work to be done about how, how we replace these people. Okay, thank you. I mean, Nick, um, in terms of just looking forward and sort of on a positive note, we're going to open to questions from the audience in a, in a minute, but I mean, are there any positives that have come out of this pandemic in terms of, you know, um, just, we talked earlier on about people working in a more um, collaborative manner, but is there anything else? I mean, obviously, you know, this industry is based on the fact that, you know, festivals, for example, running a festival is far from easy. Yeah. You know, there's, a, you, there's many, many skilled people that come together to make these work. I mean, the weather itself is a big enough thing concern. Um, but, um, you know, just, just broadly speaking, are there any kind of pluses, positives that are come out of this uh, I mean, tumultuous I time? The two key things for me, are as frustrating as it is prior to the pandemic, Government, Treasury, DCMS had uh, not a clue what festivals were. I mean, obviously, they used the term very frequently and constantly talked about Glastonbury as being exemplar, and that's all they ever used to do. They didn't understand the ecosystem. So, as frustrating as it still is to this day to speak to them and they still don't get you know, the nuances of how we deliver shows, we are definitely in Comunicado much more than we've ever been. Um, so, you know, I'd still say that's a positive. So if there are things coming down the line, hopefully not a pandemic, but other issues like supply chain or Brexit, you know, at least we have that communication channel uh, more open than it perhaps was before. And then I think Liz said, but just more collaboration. So, you know, when I talk about suppliers profiteering, they're probably the ones on the edge that constantly work in construction and they see this as an opportune moment. But, you know, those, those suppliers that work with us for 10 years, you know, they have been really loyal and we have spoken to them more than ever, you know. Uh, even to the point last year, you know, when we did get, uh, we were very lucky in the Arts Council, you know, we were placing money to them. But as Lisa said, it's very hard to spend until that inventory gets landed on site. You know, we're in, a, I guess, a fortunate position that we're paid, you know, we're a service business, so we're paid to advance shows. Um, but I think that collaborative approach, you know, I've spoken to more competitors than I ever have, you know, over the course of this year, you know, and they're a much more honesty. Like, we would probably be much more protective over our supplies, whereas now, you know, we're having constant conversations about stages, you know, is there any collaboration? We're looking at production shares more than we perhaps would do. So, and I think that's a good thing, you know, it has been horrendous. I think there will be some positives that come out of it and, you know, championing the industry. And I think going forward, you know, from a customer point of view, there's new audiences that have never been to festivals before because of the media probably being more favorable about our plight. You know, all they used to do is, hit us about you know, anything that would happen on site. So I think there's new audiences coming into the festival market that perhaps of all ages uh, are buying tickets. I mean, we've seen you know, tickets have flown out of the door. So I think that's a positive in years to come. There'll be a more buoyant market. Perhaps people said it was at saturation two or three years ago. So I think there's a new hopeful wave of growth. Great, and just, just lastly, Stuart, in terms of um, when the market does come back, and we're all hoping that it is gonna be buoyant um, in the next year and the year after that, for example. Um, <clears throat> when the gloves are off and this sort of fam uh, famously um, competitive market gets back to normal, do you expect that sense of collaboration to continue? Will this be a lasting effect? <clears throat> uh, yes and no. Um, well, f first of all, I, I think that we while well, we're all sitting here nervous about 2021 and let's see what happens during the winter of 21 into 22. I do genuinely think that 22, uh, certainly from a Killy perspective and I think probably for most other organisers, 
will potentially be our busiest year ever uh, because we've not only got our product for 2022, but we've got everything that we've moved from 20 into 21 and then subsequently into 22 as well. And I, and I do think certainly on an indoor perspective, uh, the, the roadblock that we now currently have is venue availability. Uh, there is only, so, I mean, forget supply chain, if you want to classify venues as part of the supply chain, there aren't enough venues for, for all of the product that wants to tour indoors. Uh, and we're certainly now pushing arena shows into 23, and I've even got conversations going on about 24 and 25, because we just can't get um, uh, quality dates in 22. Um, so th I, think, I think we're in for a brilliant year. Uh, we're in for a brilliant few years, and that's part of the problem in the, in the conversation with government, because they know that we will come back. They know that we will be self-surviving. They know that we will, we're entrepreneurial. And they know that if they don't help us, we'll be okay. And that, that's the big problem that we've got with government at this point in time. Uh, but, but I think, look, I, I think uh, there, there will be common, uh, there'll be commonality going forward. I think there will be many issues that we will fight uh, for as a united, on a united front. Uh, and we haven't even touched on Brexit or cabotage or work visas. I mean, that three things that are going to be huge issues uh, for all of us. Uh, but equally, I, th I think as soon as um, uh, normality returns, the gloves will be off. It's, uh, it'll just be the same, same, same shit, different year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, so questions from the audience. Does anyone have a question for our panel? Um, this is more of a kind of broad question to everyone, uh, and it's been touched on a little bit, but um, obviously we've mentioned that everyone's kind of come together through this and supported each other, and I can say as someone fairly infant in the industry, I've only been in it for about five years or so, that when I lost my job during this and I started reaching out to people on LinkedIn, the support I got was overwhelming and the groups there of people who were previously competitors at my old venue or production agencies were reaching out left, right and centre, which was lovely. And you are right, once we go back to normality, gloves will come off and business is business at the end of the day. People want to beat their competitors. But I wonder if you think that once we do return to normal that something will hopefully change in the industry. What would you like to see going forward that we don't just return to the normal, maybe we are still supporting each other, but it's not as clear cut as you're my competitor, I'm not going to help you. Kind of directing that, it's a very broad question, I do apologise, but I, just the key takeaway, what do you think might change going forward? I don't mind taking that first. Sure. Um, the companies might become competitors, but I don't think that the, the walls will go up between the people. Um, it's a small industry, people move around this industry, and you know, it's, it's really important sort of not to burn your bridges and to keep in touch with people. And I think the one thing that we're, we can all be immensely proud of is the fact that we realize that our whole industry is based on people. And if we don't come together you know, as, as a group, we can't successfully deliver what we do and what we love. So, and I think the reason that you've had so much support and so many other people have, it, we all realise the vital importance of not losing you to another industry. You know, it's, it's hard enough to tempt people into this industry sometimes. They think it's all glamorous and when they realise it's not clipboards and, and champagne all the time, um, they are put off a little bit. And I think it's going to be a little while until we can really attract new blood into the industry, until they know that there's a guaranteed industry for them to be part of. I know certainly with some of my crew, they've got temporary jobs and I will not let them leave them until I know I can give them enough work so they can feed their kids and pay the mortgage. As much as I want them back, you know, they've got far more stability working for Amazon at the moment. Um, so I, I just think it, it's going to stay a people thing. You know, you, we, we will all be able, always be able to pick up the phone to each other and talk. Uh, but we just might be a little bit cagey about how much information we actually share. But the conversations will always be open. Thank you. Is that okay? Do you want to take... Good stuff. 
Any more questions, please? One down here at the front. Hey, guys. Um, so speaking as a supplier, the, the first festival we're due to be on the site at um, requires us to be there on the 22nd of June, and it's a 20,000 capacity sold out festival. So my question is, um, how likely do you think that is to happen? And B, what requirements can you see the government um, imposing on that event in order to let that happen? And do you think it's realistic that festivals like Reading and Leeds, even Park Life, will be able to go ahead at full capacity later in the season? Who'd like to take that one? Uh, After you jump. I'll take it if you like. <laughs> um, I mean, clearly that's what we're working towards. And, um, you know, most of us in the industry are being quite clear that, you know, that, that date is what's been announced. And although there is a caveat on it, that is clearly what we're working towards. Now, the frustrating thing, you know, we've, we've heard about DCMS a few times, you know, myself, Nick, and, and various uh, other people in the industry have been talking to DCMS about the restart of festivals every two weeks since, August of last yeah. year or something like that. Uh, you know, aiming at what does it look like when we restart? And um, I, I can't really tell you. We, we, we're making some assumptions and clearly we know what happened at, at the test gigs in, in Liverpool. So, you know, what, what we assume it's going to look like is the fact that the customers are going to have to have a lateral flow test before they attend the event and, and evidence that in some sort of way. Once you're in, in the show, then there won't be any social distancing, and that's a prerequisite, of course, of festivals coming back. Um, and that will be it, essentially, from, from a consumer point of view. You, you know, from, from an organiser point of view, you might put more hand sanitizer in, you might provide more space for people you know, who might want a little bit more space comfort. Um, from a working point of view, uh, lateral flow test again before you work on site a test regime every three days for your working personnel having that certified and uh, mandated in some kind of way I think will be clear clearly you might be working with a number of measures around close contact and looking at mitigation around show critical roles so what your management team look like and you might increase the level of testing there the, there will be differences around accommodation and how your personnel and, and, and team live so single dwellings rather than two people in a bunker bin so there's a, a whole load of assumptions we think are going to happen but no one no one knows do they nick no no that is the frustration you know we weekly say do you realize the uh you know the production cycle you know with normally it's 12 months we start working on shows in september for the next year so everything's expedited there's so much focus on covid but the concern is you know to deliver a show in everyday life is really challenging in itself you know we've had terrible weather for the last month so you know we've got concerns about you know some of our shows it's just going to be you know there isn't enough trackway loads of trackways up at hs2 so there are some huge challenges and all the focus with people like dcms and sag groups is often around covid and i'm trying to say you know we need the least engineering controls as possible and as john says testing gets the greatest coverage in our opinion but what we can't have is on 14th of june some new guidance that then sets out all of these different parameters that just aren't deliverable we've got to be realistic you know we were on a call the other day with uh, the national lead for test and trace there's been a legislative change in two days which now they're trying to trying to suggest that everybody who attends now needs to go you know and, uh, and sort of use the qr code you know things like that all add there's much more impacts on that it then adds to queuing times it then becomes a ct issue you know you've got audiences members potentially 20,000 people trying to get to a show because it's all been slowed down so they just don't understand and that is the frustration but yeah we are it's a, it is a concern i'm not going to lie and has caused sleepless nights for many of our production team mm -hmm. I, th I think sorry if i, if I may um, of course I, th I think steve if i was running a show on june 22 i'd be very nervous uh and i'd have a contingency date for sure uh because as nick says i think when we get to june 14 while we're eking information out on a daily and a weekly basis with DCMS, it's literally on occasions two steps forward, one step back. Um, and I think what we do know um, is that there are going to be three different levels of classification of events. 
Um, we have argued for many weeks now that the lower level should be the same as going to a pub. And we've been, we've been very clearly uh, shown now publicly uh, that pubs will operate with impunity. Uh, we argued at a thousand level. We think it's now over 2,000. We actually think as of this week, any event under 4,000 will be able to operate as normal. No testing, no, no uh, certification whatsoever. Uh, I think uh, both with the indoor guidance group and the festival guidance group, there's also been some wins over uh, what's going to be required for certification. Uh, we've certainly got lab-based PCR tests thrown out, uh, and we've now got an acceptance from uh, DCMS that uh, um, lateral flow home administered tests will be acceptable. And there's also some visibility starting to appear that if you have been vaccinated, then the proof of vaccination will be the NHS app, which is in beta testing at the moment. Uh, and for those of you who've had vaccinations, if you go and download that, it'll actually give you a QR code. It's only valid at the moment through to June 20, because the new version comes in on June 21. And then the, the, the unknown level for us, though, is from 4,000. That, that'll cover from 4,000, we think, through to about 20,000. The unknown level is over 20,000, uh, where there are all sorts of dialogues going on, as I understand it, about you can get into a festival without any uh, proof, but every time you want to go into a bar or a tent uh, or a, a, a busy stage, then you're going to then have to show proof of vaccination or um, a negative test. So there's still a lot of work to do. So the immediate future looks safer for 4,000 and below capacity events. Yes. So you yeah. expect to see more of those sort of in the near future. I, I, I think so. Yeah, OK. Um, well, I think we're going to have to leave it there, unless there's any other urgent questions. But I think that was a very interesting, insightful panel. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you.